بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آئی ہوپ یو آل ول بی فائن اینڈ انجوائنگ گڈ ہیلتھ آئی ایم ڈاکٹر محمد علی ہاشمی فرام یونیورسٹی آف ایجوکیشن ایٹ اے کیمپس اینڈ وی آر ہیئر ٹو اسٹڈی دا سبجیکٹ آف انٹروڈکشن ٹو بایو کیمسٹری This is lecture number 23 and uh, in this lecture we will study about significance of lipids in membrane transport mechanism. In the previous lectures we uh, learned about significance of lipids in uh, membranes and then uh, about fluid mosaic model of the membrane structure. So this lecture is just the continuation of the those topics and it will explain about which mechanisms are involved in the transport of materials across the membranes. The main concepts uh, you will learn in this lecture would include uh, the significance of lipids in membrane transport and uh, uh, different transport mechanisms and then uh, through those mechanisms those mechanisms involve uh, three main types passive transport um, active transport and then uh, endocytosis and exocytosis so uh, in this lecture we'll be studying about the passive transport so Uh, transport means anything that moves across the cell membrane either it moves from the extracellular environment to the intracellular environment or uh, cell discharges something from inside the cell to the outside world and uh, that il that includes the uptake of nutrients and uh, the uh, excretion of waste materials as well so these all things uh, come under the umbrella of membrane transport so membrane transport is essential for cellular life and uh, as cells proceed through their life cycle a vast amount of exchange is necessary to maintain the function so the transport is always necessary to maintain the function of the lives Uh, we need transport in our daily lives to uh, transport and to send different things to different places and then to keep the life functions running. Similarly, cell is a machinery which needs uh, a lot of transport and exchange of goods to maintain its uh, life functions. Transport may involve the incorporation of biological molecules and the discharge of waste products that are necessary for normal function. So, um, as I told you earlier, it uh, transport can be uh, incorporation of biological molecules, uptake of uh, nutrients from the cell, um, and uh, discharge of waste products that are necessary for the uh, normal life and uh, daily routine of the uh, cell. Membrane transport refers to the movement of particles that is solute across or through a membrane barrier so membrane transport can be linked to the ter term that it means the movement of particles not only the liquid or the solvent form it also moves uh, particles or solute uh, form uh, across the uh, membrane barrier so membranes are normally selective selectively permeable they are called as selectively permeable what does that mean selectively permeable means it lets some some uh, substances pass through the membrane and stops others so it it is not like it's an open channel that everything can go inside the cell and can come out of the cell no It's a, it's a security controlled gate that uh, some substances can pass through this and others cannot. So these membranous barriers in the case of the cell for example consist of a phospholipid bilayer. So what, what is that barrier? That is a phospholipid bilayer. It's a double layer of phospholipids.
the phospholipids orient themselves in such a way so that the hydrophilic or polar heads are nearest the extracellular and intracellular mediums so as we already studied uh, about the fluid mosaic model uh, we know that the polar heads uh, are they are the nearest the um, extracellular intracellular environment and the hydrophobic or the non polar tails they align between the two hydrophilic head groups so i'll just uh, take you to the slide where the um, figure is present and here you can see that the polar heads they are either um, towards the cell or towards the uh, outside wall so uh, this this side shows uh, the cellular environment and that is the outside world so you can see that these polar heads uh, which are depicted in these red uh, balls they they are um, attached to the cell and then they are attached to the outside wall and the non polar tails these uh, yellow long tails they are between these polar heads they align themselves uh, between this uh, phospholipid bilayer membrane transport is dependent upon the permeability of the membrane transmembrane solute concentration and the size and charge of the solute so what are the main factors on which the membrane transport depend that depends on these following three factors so the first is permeability of the membrane what is being allowed to go inside the cell and what is not allowed or what is forbidden so it it depends on that thing the second thing is transmembrane solute concentration if a solute has to move from outside the cell to the inside uh, what is the concentration of that solute uh, inside the cell and outside the cell so we have to look for that concentration if uh, the solute is moving against the concentration gradient then definitely that process will require energy but if it is moving along the concentration gradient then that process will not require the aid of external energy and the third thing is size and charge of the solute if solute molecules are smaller they will move easily and pass through the membrane if their size is large definitely that will pose a problem and then there will be uh, specific mechanisms to take those uh, kind of uh, solutes inside and outside of the cell and similarly their charge if uh, the, the charge on the particles can uh, affect their entry or exit through the plasma membrane so solute particles can traverse the membrane via three main mechanisms that is passive transport facilitated diffusion and active transport so some of these uh, transport mechanisms require the input of energy and use of a transmembrane protein whereas other mechanisms do not incorporate secondary molecules so uh, out of these mechanisms we will study some mechanisms will operate without the use of any energy of the cell and uh, some mechanisms will be there which require the use of energy because they are moving the uh, particles or uh, solute molecules against a concentration gradient so if you move anything against a concentration gradient you require energy for that so here are the main mechanisms of transport the first one is passive transport number two is active transport then endocytosis and exocytosis so in this lecture we'll cover the passive transport and uh, the rest of these three mechanisms will be covered in the next lecture so we move to the passive transport the most direct forms of membrane transport are passive so it's common that uh, many direct forms of the membrane transport they uh, work in a passive way what is passive transport it is a naturally occurring phenomenon and does not require the cell to exert any of its energy to accomplish the movement so 
this passive transport is naturally occurring from a phenomenon which occurs naturally and commonly and uh, it do not use any of the energy of the cell so it happens without ex the expense of any energy uh, in passive transport substances move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration so uh, that is very um, easy and understandable uh, you you should have studied basic science so this is a fact that anything uh, which ha has two different concentration gradients uh, it moves from the area of higher concentration gradient to the area of lower concentration gradient uh, consider the example of uh, a, 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 uh, air freshener which you just press and in, in the corner of a room and very soon it spreads to the whole room so where you uh, press the button of that uh, air freshener bottle in that area when you release the those molecules of the air freshener the its concentration was higher but in the other parts of the room its concentration was uh, zero so uh, it simply diffused uh, through the air and uh, very soon you will see that all um, uh, the, the molecules of the that air freshener they are in the whole room so no energy was required and that just spread throughout the room so the, uh, this way substances move from an area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration a physical space in which there is a range of concentrations of a single substance is said to have a concentration gradient so wherever well, uh, there are two different concentration gradients of uh, concentrations of a same substance like uh, the air freshener in a place where it was sprayed and its concentration in the whole room so whenever there are two different concentrations of a substance that substance is said to have concentration gradient So plasma membranes, as we already studied in the last lectures, that they are asymmetric. They are not symmetrical in structures. The interior of the membrane is not identical to the exterior of the membrane. So both sides are uh, different in structures. And in fact, there is a considerable difference between the array of phospholipids and proteins between the two leaflets that form a membrane. So the inner leaflet, which is towards the cytoplasm, and the outer leaflet, which is towards the outside of the cell uh, they have different array of phospholipids different arrangement of phospholipids and proteins between themselves so the proteins and phospholipids they are arranged differently um, around the two different sides of the plasma membrane so on the interior of the membrane some proteins serve to anchor the membrane to fibers of the cytoskeleton so in, uh, on the inside of the cell some proteins are necessary which hold the membrane and bind it to the fibers of the cytoskeleton if they don't hold the membrane the membrane can slip or move uh, from there so uh, some proteins bind the membrane to the uh, cytoskeleton so that it keeps in place and around the cell So there are peripheral proteins on the exterior of the membrane that bind elements of the extracellular matrix. So you can see that the uh, membrane uh, is asymmetric uh, because on the inside the structure is different and outside it is um, different. So there are proteins on the outside which uh, bind the elements of extracellular matrix which uh, keep the cell in place when cells are joined together to form tissues. So these proteins bind the cell to the outside world. Carbohydrates are also attached to lipids or proteins and they, they are also found on the exterior surface of the plasma membrane. These carbohydrates complex, uh, these carbohydrate complexes help the cell bind substances that the cell needs in the extracellular fluid. So what is the function of those carbohydrates which we saw protruding out of the membrane uh, just in that case? Uh, you can see that uh, these little um, protrudings out of the cell membrane uh, 
uh, what is their main function they are there to bind some substances which are needed to be transported um, inside the cell so these all things adds considerably to the selective nature of plasma membrane so all these factors we just discussed they uh, add to the uh, selectivity of the plasma membrane uh, and uh, make it selectively permeable so now uh, the, this figure has already been discussed in many times in fluid mosaic model and just now so uh, for now we'll just have a look at it uh, through the perspective of transport mechanism so you can see that uh, different molecules like you see cholesterol um, they are embedded in the plasma membrane and then um, they are glycolipids uh, with carbohydrates and glycoproteins with carbohydrates so these uh, uh, these beads are carbohydrates and these uh, bigger masses protein underneath it so these carbohydrates they uh, function to attach different substances which needed which need to be moved inside the cell Similarly, we have different protein channels, uh, which like this one, you see uh, these channels let different substances pass through the cell membrane. So um, we already discussed this point as well, that the plasma membranes are amphiphilic. I mean, they have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. So as we just discussed, that these uh, um, these head groups they are hydrophilic regions while these tails are hydrophobic regions because they're non-polar heads are polar they're hydrophilic these tails are non-polar they are hydrophobic regions so this characteristic helps the movement of some materials through the membrane and hinders the movement of others so this is a uh, this is the beauty of the cell membrane that has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic ends so it can control the materials which pass through it. Lipid soluble materials with a low molecular weight can easily slip through the hydrophobic lipid core of the membrane. So if something has a low molecular weight and it's in, uh, soluble in lipids that can easily pass through these uh, barriers, these non-polar regions of the plasma membrane. But uh, substances such as, uh, so substances such as the fat soluble vitamins a d e and k they readily pass through the plasma membranes and in the digestive tract and other tissues so these vitamins they are fat soluble and they can easily pass through the plasma membrane um, in the digestive tract like in the intestines and uh, where uh, all the food particles get absorbed into the uh, cells and into the blood Fat soluble drugs and hormones also gain easy entry into the cells and are readily transported into the body's tissues and organs. So the drugs and hormones which are fat soluble, they get an easy entry into the cells. Molecules of oxygen and carbon dioxide have no charge and so pass through membranes by simple diffusion. So these molecules, small molecules which are uncharged, they can pass easily through the cell membrane by diffusion. Polar substances present problems for the membrane. So the substances which have polar groups, uh, uh, you just saw that uh, we have uh, these polar heads and then in between them we have non-polar tails. So any, anything that needs to go through here, it needs to pass, pass through these non-polar regions. So polar substances will have a problem here because they will not be soluble in fats or lipids and they they will face difficulty passing through the plasma membrane so while some polar molecules connect easily with the outside of a cell they cannot readily pass through the lipid core of the plasma membrane membrane that is uh, what we just discussed so additionally while small ions could easily slip through the spaces in the mosaic of the membrane so small ions have the capability that I mean they are small enough that they can uh, slip through the uh, spaces in the that mosaic of the membrane but the problem is that they have charges on them so those charges prevent them from passing through the plasma membrane so ions such as sodium potassium calcium and chloride they must have special means of penetrating plasma membrane they should have some channels or gates through which they can pass they cannot simply diffuse through the plasma membrane 
So simple sugars and amino acids also need help with the transport across plasma membrane. Similarly, sugar molecules, they are also polar molecules and they need help to get transported across the membrane and that uh, is achieved by various transmembrane proteins or channels through which these sugar molecules can pass. Now we discuss about the diffusion. Uh, diffusion is a passive process of transport. So a single substance tends to move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until the concentration is equal across the space. So you see that this is a plasma membrane and uh, this in the, the bottom space is inside the cell. So if you look, uh, this substance, its concentration is very higher outside the cell, but its concentration is very low inside the cell. So it needs to pass through the membrane and uh, balance its uh, concentration across this membrane. So um, it just passes through its area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration through simple diffusion. Just like uh, I gave you example of uh, the uh, air freshener uh, diffusing into the room. So now you see that after simple diffusion, its concentration became equal inside and outside the cell. So that is how this process will take place. Uh, here is a little video for you where you will learn um, about the diffusion process uh, interactively. Molecules dissolved in a solution are in constant random motion due to their kinetic energy. One result of this motion is that dissolved molecules become evenly distributed throughout the solution. This tendency of molecules to spread out is an example of diffusion. But how do these molecules come to be evenly distributed? Let's start with a beaker of plain water. What will happen if we now add a lump of sugar to the water? A lump of sugar is composed of many individual sugar molecules. And even as a solid lump, the individual sugar molecules are in motion. When the lump is dropped into the water, it begins to dissolve. Individual sugar molecules move randomly and constantly from the area where they are common to the area where they are scarce. This type of motion, when molecules move from areas of their higher concentration to areas of their lower concentration, is called diffusion. Diffusion continues until all the sugar molecules become evenly dispersed throughout the beaker. The rate of diffusion is affected by temperature, size of molecules, and the steepness of the concentration gradient. Although not specifically shown in this animation, this is one of the processes whereby materials are exchanged between a cell and its environment. So, uh, materials, they can uh, uh, pass through the plasma membrane through the simple diffusion. And uh, they move within cells cytosol by diffusion and certain materials move through the plasma membrane by diffusion as well. Diffusion expends no energy. On the contrary, concentration gradients are a form of potential energy dissipated as the gradient is eliminated. So what is what are the concentration gradients? They, they are a form of potential energy which is uh, dissipated or used when the gradient is eliminated, mean the um, the concentration became equal on both sides of the membrane, then the, that potential energy is dissipated. Each separate substance in a medium, such as the extracellular fluid, has its own concentration gradient. So concentration gradient is not a universal phenomenon. It, it is different for each substance. So uh, there are sugar molecules, there are other substances, there are solute particles, water, sodium, potassium ions, everything has its own concentration gradient and independent that is independent of the concentration gradients of other materials. So in addition, each substance will diffuse according to its own gradient. It will not have any effect or anything to do with the other substances and their concentration gradients.
So within a system, there will be different types, different rates of diffusion of the different substances in the medium. So each substance will be moving at its own uh, speed depending on its own concentration gradient. Next is facilitated diffusion. Uh, in facilitated diffusion, uh, materials diffuse across the plasma membrane with the help of membrane proteins. So, uh, facilitated diffusion helps those molecules which cannot simply pass through the plasma membrane uh, due to certain reasons like we studied for uh, smaller ions which have uh, charges on them, they are not allowed to pass through the plasma membrane. So, a concentration gradient exists that would allow these materials to diffuse into the cell without expending cellular energy. But these materials um, are ions or polar molecules that are repelled by the hydrophobic parts of the cell membrane. So facilitated transport proteins shield these materials from the repulsive forces of the membrane, thus allowing them to diffuse into the cell. So uh, the, those proteins, the facilitated transport proteins, just uh, help these substances to pass through the membrane. So the material being transported is first attached to the protein or glycoprotein receptors on the exterior surface of the plasma membrane. So the first thing is the attachment of the material which needs to be transported uh, inside the cell. So this allows the material that is needed by the cell to be removed from the extracellular fluid. So when the material is attached to those protein receptors, it is removed from the extracellular fluid and then substances are passed to specific integral proteins that facilitate their passage. So first it is attached to the receptors outside the membrane and then the substance is moved to the uh, specific proteins which allow its passage through the uh, membrane. So some of these integral proteins form a pore or a channel through the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, we just uh, learned about these pores in uh, here. Uh, you can see that they have a, a specific pore or a passage uh, which let things pass through the bilayer. So uh, there are some other carrier proteins which bind with the substance and aid its diffusion through the membrane. So some protein help uh, move uh, things through channels and some proteins bind with the substances and aid in the diffusion process. So channels are specific for the substance that is being transported. This is important that those channels are not universal, they are specific for the substances. Channel proteins have hydrophilic domains exposed to the intracellular and extracellular fluids. They additionally have a hydrophilic channel through their core that provides a hydrated opening through the membrane layers. So um, they have a hydrophilic channel on, on these sides which allow the opening uh, to the in intracellular and extracellular environment. So passage through the channel, these uh, channels allow polar compounds to avoid the non-polar central layer of the plasma membrane that would otherwise slow or prevent their entry into the cell. So a polar molecule will definitely have problem here in the uh, non-polar regions of the plasma membrane. So this protein is shielding those interaction and uh, a polar molecule will pass easily through this uh, protein which will stop its interactions with these non-polar parts of the phospholipid bilayer. So another type of protein embedded in the plasma membrane is a carrier protein. This um, aptly named protein binds a substance and in doing so triggers a change of its own shape moving the bound molecule from the outside of the cell to the, uh, its interior. So what this protein does it binds the substance and then changes its shape and takes the substance into the cell and releases it there. So, um, and it, depending on the concentration gradient, the material may also move from inside the cell to the outside the cell. And carrier proteins are typically specific for a single substance. This selectivity adds to the overall selectivity of the plasma membrane. So, uh, as usual, these proteins are also selective and specific for different substances. So, you can see that a substance binds here. The protein changes its shape and moves the substance here and then it releases it inside the cell. So, now uh, for the facilitated diffusion, I have another animation for you.
uh, which will uh, just uh, uh, clarify your concept about facilitated diffusion. In the process known as facilitated diffusion, a special carrier protein with a central channel acts as a selective corridor which helps molecules move across the membrane. These special carrier molecules that form the protein channel bind only to a specific molecule, such as a particular sugar or amino acid. Once the molecule binds to the carrier protein, this protein helps or facilitates the diffusion process by changing shape and moving the molecule down its concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell where it is released. Facilitated diffusion is similar to simple diffusion in that both involve movement of molecules down their concentration gradient and this movement is carried out without any input of energy. However, in facilitated diffusion, the movement of molecules will only take place if it is facilitated or helped by a special protein carrier in the membrane. Facilitated diffusion can occur in either direction depending on the concentration gradient. If there is a higher concentration of the particular molecule inside the cell, the same carrier protein would then transport the molecules out of the cell. So, uh, if we summarize all these uh, progressive transport mechanisms we studied in this lecture, um, the first point would be that passive transport operates without the use of cell energy. Diffusion, what is diffusion? It is the movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So that happens without the use of cells energy. Facilitated diffusion, what is that? It is the movement of molecules through specific channels or carrier proteins and still without the use of energy. So let's conclude this uh, by watching uh, an animation which summarizes all these things together and uh, uh, I hope that will uh, in increase the level of your uh, understanding about this mechanism. In order for us to use the molecules and energy we get from food, we must transport them across cell membranes. Transport of nutrients is essential for all cells, but we'll use cells in the small intestine to teach the principles of membrane transport. Let's zoom into the surface of an intestinal cell. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules can move across it, while others cannot. How do materials enter and leave cells? Lipids, such as these yellow molecules, can move freely across the lipid bilayer. Notice that the lipid molecules move down their concentration gradient from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This is an example of simple diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport. It does not require energy from the cell, but it does depend on the concentration gradient, size and charge of the molecule or ion. However, most molecules cannot cross the lipid bilayer. Instead, molecules like the sugar fructose move into intestinal cells by facilitated diffusion, moving down their concentration gradient and through transport proteins. It also differs because it acts only on specific molecules and the transport proteins can become saturated, reducing the amount of diffusion. However, facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy from the cell, so like simple diffusion, it's a form of passive transport. The majority of water molecules cross the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion, also called osmosis, through specific protein channels called aquaporins. I hope uh, these, uh, this lecture and these animations uh, would have increased your understanding of the uh, uh, passive transport and uh, about uh, how things and uh, uh, chemicals move across the cell membrane from uh, inside the cell to the outside world and from the extracellular environment to the inside of the cell. So I, I have an assignment for you. It's a, it's a little question. It's a scenario you have to study and then you have to select the correct option. This is uh, about 
um, the permeability of the membrane so it will uh, it will show how much understanding you have gained uh, in this lecture so you can ask uh, for the correct answer uh, from your teacher in the google classroom um, here are the references that were consulted for the preparation of this lecture and uh, i wish you the best of luck for your studies we'll see you in the next lecture with uh, more transport mechanisms and uh, until then, Allah Hafiz.